When last we left our intrepid adventurers, the characters are sleeping on a rock outcropping called Sleep's Furrowed Brow, high above the village of Two Roads. It's a place where dreamers can see the future, past, and present. Seraph's Dream Seraph wakes up and he's in bed with a red-haired creature that's trying to kill him. He fights back and as he does, more monsters come rushing into the room. Seraph grows his wings back suddenly and flies away from the monsters towards the north. He finds himself flying above northern Deserata. The dream changes and he finds himself chained to a set of stalks. A dark woman with a blinding light where her face should be comes over to him. She's carrying the death master necklace Seraph was once forced to wear. She offers it to him. In his mind, he doesn't want the necklace, but in the dream he gladly accepts it being placed over his head. He is overcome by a sudden burst of joy as the necklace rests on his shoulders and the dream ends. He wonders why something so horrible made him happy. Scala's Dream Scala is in the dungeon of the Dark Lady. She's being held down while her face is being removed. The Dark Woman says, Scala of the Three Souls, it's so nice to see that you've decided to join our games. Many of them will involve screaming on your part. As the dream ends, a creature is stitching her new face on. Scala screams. Scala's second dream. Scala is sitting at her dressing table, preparing herself for the night to come. She avoids looking into her mirror so as not to catch the sight of what they have done to her face. It has been stitched on crooked, giving her a leering mouth and an off-centered nose. The face is immobile. Scala knows that in an hour, the door to her room will open and they will be allowed in. It's been years since she started in the service of the Dark Woman, and she knows that resistance is useless. It has all been burned out of her. But what really scares Scala most is that in the last couple of months, she has begun to like the visits, and she hates herself for it. She knows that very soon, there will be nothing left of her soul, just a puppet to do the dark woman's bidding. She hears the sound of the secret door open behind her and the passing of soft bare feet towards her. Scala finishes brushing her hair and then says the last three free words that are left to her. She says, I'm ready, Morgan. And an ax swings through the air and takes her head off. And the dream ends. Marcus's dream. Marcus hears a voice talking. He slowly wakes up and removes the pillow from his head. He hears a woman say, I know it's your birthday, beloved, but you can't stay in bed all day. Marcus looks up and he sees his wife, Tannis, standing with her hands on her waist. She says, my parents will be in the greeting room soon and you need to be ready. The dream ends. Marcus's second dream. Marcus lays on the ground. He's been beaten. He finds himself surrounded by Sheesh. There are others with him, and he realizes he has failed them. Two elvish women stand in a pit below him. He's been told 
that he must destroy them. He is handed a sword, hefting the weight as if to strike them, but instead he falls upon the blade. Cherie screams, no! And the sheesh around him begin to beat their shields as the dark night of 300 years begins. Marcus's third dream. Marcus is dead, but not dead. He sits up and muscles strain to bring him upright. Squires come in to help armor him. They heft his armor and tie it to him. His body has swollen and the armor fits poorly. He can still feel the wound that killed him as if it happened yesterday when he was Marcus the Paladin. But he has been in service to the voice from the East since that day. The giant cadaver known as the Hammer of the North. But today it will end. The gates of Stantown will be breached and the voice will destroy all. He steps out of his tent and looks up at the night sky. It is dark, even though it's noon. Such is the gift of the voice. In the distance, he sees siege engines at work on the city's walls. Picking up an iron hammer, he goes to make war on the last vestiges of humanity. Akai's dream. Akai is in a bar, and the person that kidnapped her a month ago comes and sits beside her. The woman greets Akai by calling her Esneth. She says that Esneth is her name from the old times during the reign of the Tropidorians. The woman introduces herself as Dejern Lonel, one of the ridden of her fathers. Lonel is trying to convince Esneth to side against her father in unleashing the ritual of the true death on the world. The dream changes, and Akai, Esneth, is with her father, the Lord of the Tropidorians. He takes her into a room with a scrying device in it. He tells her that they are losing the war with the people from the sky, the Magadrillians, and they are trapped holding out in the Snow Light Mountain Fortress. He says that she is the only one who can save them from the plight of many other races she will need to sacrifice herself by becoming the weapon when they recite the ritual of the true death. She can balance the scales. She finds herself crying but says that she agrees she will become the weapon. When Akai wakes up, she wonders why something that happened over a thousand years ago is so important now. Morgan dreams of the past. Morgan is being dragged to the throne of Jacenis Distaria I, also known as the Dark Woman. She has put up a good fight, but Morgan has been beaten. As she waits at the foot of the throne, the doors to the room open behind her, and she hears a conversation between Distaria and a male voice. Distaria says, Peace, Lord Isaiah, how good to see you. How may I help you after you've barged into my throne room? Isaiah's voice is gruff. He says, I heard that you have my future wife here. Distaria says, this is your future wife. Distaria pulls Morgan's bloody face off the floor. And Isaiah says, yes, and I'll be taking her with me. He picks Morgan up and starts to carry her away. Distaria sneers. I don't think you should stay in Deserata, Isaiah. I think your welcome is worn out here. Isaiah nods and says, I'll be in Sada Kadish then. But if any of my family are touched by you or yours from this day forward, I'll come back and I know what you are. And when I come back, I'll cut your head off 
and I'll bury it in a deep mine shaft. That's the best way to deal with your kind. Morgan's dream of the future. Morgan feels old in this dream. She is older than she could ever imagine. And she is ready to go and be with the goddess. She has no words because she has no tongue. But she has legs and she forces herself to go on that last walk. She comes to the trigger of the secret passage and opens it. Walking into the richly appointed room, she sees Scala is brushing her hair at the dressing table. Morgan hefts the axe with two hands and walks closer. Scala stops combing her hair for a second and pulls the strands away from her neck. She says, I'm ready, Morgan. Using all of the strength that she has left, Morgan swings the blade and takes off Scala's head. It was the lady's mercy that she was asked to deliver. And now she can rest. In the morning, they discuss their dreams. Marcus is worried. Morgan and Scala are quiet about their dreams. Seraph finds himself strangely happy, and Akai realizes that the weapon needs to be used again. But why? And how? And against who?